I'm Chad Gravelese with Aerolite TV and your host of the show, Connect Up. If you're looking to gain traction in your career or business, you're at the right place because here we talk about connection. You need to know how to connect with the right people in the right way so you can build valuable relationships that lead you to career success. We have conversations about how to find your voice in your career. I interview communication experts, time and focus masters, and everyday people who have stories to tell of challenges overcome, goals achieved, and how their inner and outer communication and ultimately their relationships accelerated their progress and elevated their journey. Success in life is just a collection of the right conversations with yourself and others. Connect up to a better version of yourself. Connect up to your goals and a brighter future. Disconnect from the things that are holding you back and connect your way to where you want to be. In today's show, I have the opportunity of interviewing an efficiency and time management nerd, Alexis Hasselberger. She spent the first 15 plus years of her career involved in operations and HR at several different early age startups where there's always way more to do than there's people to do it. And so she's had an opportunity to help companies develop systems and processes to get things done. And she also believes that work-life balance is really important. And we're gonna talk about that today in today's interview, the importance of work-life balance, how to create that balance so that you have deliberate times where you're disconnecting and deliberate times where you're connecting so that you will always have 100% focus on the people you're talking with and on the tasks you're working on. And it's those focus skills that are gonna help accelerate your career. If you feel that time keeps getting away from you, if you feel that you have all these overdue tasks, if you feel that there's just not enough time to get everything done that you want to, and, and, and your goals keep slipping away, today's episode is for you. You're going to learn how to get control of your time so you get things done, so that you have less stress in your life, and so that you're not overworking in order to be more productive. So please join me in welcoming Alexis Hasselberger to our show. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. We're excited to hear today a lot about time management and, and skills that are gonna help us move forward towards the goals that we have in our career. And first, I want you to expand a little bit upon what I, I, I mentioned a little bit in our introduction and just kind of what is your story? What brought you to becoming a time management nerd and enthusiast and, if, and an efficiency nerd? What brought you to this place of where you're at now in your career? Sure. So my career has been entirely in startups. So I've you know, never worked at a company that was more than 40 people unless it got bought by another company and became more than that. Usually when I've started at a company, it's been like two people, three people. And when you're in that kind of environment and you're trying to start a new company and a new venture, there are a million things to do and two or three people to do them. And so you have to get really good at sort of reigning in the chaos and figuring out how to do that in a streamlined way that doesn't make you burn out and make you crazy and also puts that company on a path forward. And so over time, over the last 20 years or so of my career, what I've realized, even though I, my, my stated role was HR and operations, is that what I'm really good at is getting things done. And so I recently decided to take that out of an in-house environment and try to bring that to more people. That's really great that you're you're focusing in on your strengths because a part of uh, finding your voice in your career is also discovering what are your strengths and what what drives you, what makes you happy. And it seems like a lot of what you're doing is you're helping to connect systems and processes and departments together through those different systems. And, and here at the show, it's all about connection. And so we wanna hear more about that. Um, and, it, and, and I like how you, you, you're showing us that once we find our strengths, we can always build upon that. We can add new skill sets into our career. And we, we, we want to keep adding in new skill sets, but we need to start by finding what are my strengths right now and then how can I build from there? So, mm -hmm. so what do you enjoy about where things are heading in your career right now? I, I really like the ability to be able to meet more people and bring these skills to more people because I think one thing that we, re, we don't always realize when we're noticing what our strengths are, are that those strengths that we have that come really easily to us, those are not necessarily things that come easily to other people. 
And I think because, you know, often we're in our own head and we're not always outwardly looking, we're often like inwardly looking. We just think like, oh, this is easy for me, so it must be easy for other people too. And I think that that skill gap is actually where a lot of us can bring value to other people and that, you know, what comes really easily to me doesn't actually come that easily to other people. And so that's how I can bring that, that out. That's really great. And it's almost like you can also uh, uh, you can fill in those puzzle pieces, like where what comes easy to you, you now create one puzzle piece in a company and then somebody else can, can bring in their strengths to what's easy to them. And then you kind of, and as those puzzle pieces all connect together, now, now things are really moving forward. Now that business really starts to move forward and the team continues to grow together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And recognizing those skills in each other. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the great things about working in startups and small companies is every person is not siloed. Everyone has to work together. Um, and, you know, just because I'm HR in operations, that doesn't mean that I don't have to participate in marketing or sales or other things just because you need to do that. And I can learn a lot from salespeople who are great at connecting to people and who have no problem talking to strangers and things like that. You see how that is really helpful to them and how you can bring, bring those strengths into your own life. That's perfect. Tell us about your new business and, and your ventures with that and what are some of your goals with it? Sure, so um, my new business is a time management and productivity consulting and coaching business. And so what that means is I'm looking for either individuals who have really big lives or big work lives or uh, companies who really want to spend their development dollars on ensuring that their employees are really productive without burning out. And I think, you know, something that we find in, Sil in Silicon Valley where I work um, and in startups is that you got a lot of young people who are willing to work 80 hours a week, but that doesn't mean they should be doing that because working 80 hours a week really does it's not the most productive thing i mean studies have shown that the longer in the day you work you're not actually working you're you know playing at the ping pong table or feeling resentful that you're in the office for so many hours but you're not actually getting more work done and so trying to help uh, founders of these startups realize that that's not the only path and that they can be taking a more productive path and that i can show them how to do that and work with those teams or those individuals to bring more value into their own lives because for me, you know, I have a family, I have interests outside of work, and that's why time management and productivity is really important to me because I want to be able to get all the stuff done that I have to get done and then still have a lot of time left to do all the things that I want to be doing. That, I totally have experienced that. It's, uh, I'm also building my own startup company and I've worked for startup companies as well. And it's very true that we, we get really passionate about what we're trying to build and it's easy to kind of put aside that life balance aspect and and overwork to the point where like you're saying yeah we might be working 80 hours a week but how many of those hours are focused productive hours maybe 40 you know right. and so whereas the rest is distraction tell me a little bit more about kind of how you're achieving life balance and what how does life balance connect to time management and, um, and a little bit more about that, because Yeah, that really so uh, are you familiar with the concept of segregators versus integrators? No. So segregators and integrators, are, it's just a way of looking at the world in terms of how you like to have work-life balance. So for some people, work-life balance is that uh, work and life are totally separated from each other, and we call those people segregators. And those are people who find it really easy to have very firm boundaries with work. And then there are people who are integrators, who do a lot better actually if they are sort of always checking their email or they just feel really stressed if they're not able to connect in that way. Um, and so those are integrators. And I think that everybody exists sort of on that spectrum somewhere. And knowing where you are on that spectrum allows you to help figure out what makes sense for you in terms of setting your own boundaries with work. And so for me, I'm, I'm pretty far towards the segregator end of things. Um, which means that I have pretty strong boundaries. Like I don't check work email on weekends. I don't check work email on, in the evening. When I go on vacation, I try to go to places where nobody can reach me. Um, I, you know, I like to, when I'm at work, I'm not doing my home to-do list. I'm not checking calls. I'm not, do, I'm not checking my home email. When I'm at work, I'm 100% focused on work. And when I'm at home, I'm 100% focused on home. And so for me, that works best. I happen to be pretty 
pretty, I have firm boundaries at work, which people are always surprised about, but you'd be surprised. No one ever reaches, like if you don't answer your work email at night, nothing bad happens typically. Somebody will find a way to reach you if they really need to talk to you. Uh, so I am, now that you say that, I'm realizing that I'm a segregator. I, uh, I've always worked at home ever since I came out of college. So I literally have not had any experience not working at home. And I found very quickly that I needed to separate my home and work life, which is even more difficult when you're working at home and you physically are in the same space that you're living your personal life. As I've kind of worked, wiggled my way through figuring out how to make it work at home, I've, I've had to separate just a, a straight line between my work life and my home life where I have a set schedule where I'm focusing on work, I'm answering emails at a certain time, I'm doing this at a certain time, and then you know after you know around 5:30 or so I'm done with work and now it's and now my focus is on my family because I I realized that what 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 happened for for the first few months that I was working at home and really for the whole first year is that I would you know walk 10 feet from my home office to the living room commute my way home you know in a couple of seconds and I'd be hanging out with my wife and with my son but I my focus was still kind of on work. I was still thinking about work things. My cogs were still spinning. And and my wife was the first one that pointed that out to me. She's like, where are you? You know, you're, it seems like, it. we can't hide. It's like, I like to see it like we, uh, we have this like projection screen where our focus is. And people can't really read our minds and see exactly where our focus is, but they know when we're not focused on them. You know, they know when we're not with them and and so a part of managing my time is that i've had to learn how to deliberately tell myself okay i'm done with work i'm now closing the conversation that i've had with work all day i'm exiting my office i'm now home and now i'm 100 percent focused on my family and and my relationship with my wife has been able to improve because of that because if, I, if that kept on going i mean year after year that would really interfere with our marriage me not being there even though i was physically there she didn't just want a father and a husband that was just there physically she needed my focus to be there mm -hmm. um and i've found that when i put my 100 percent focus on my family during the time that i've designated for my family um I, I feel much more focused when I am focused on work. It's almost like when I don't do that, when I'm trying to focus on work, my mind gets all split and it's like, no, you need time for your family and yada, yada, yada. And then I end up having half focus on everything. Right. And then you have guilt on both fronts, right? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. when you're at work and you're thinking about family stuff, you're thinking, well, I'm not putting 100% towards my goals here. And when you're you know, thinking about your work email when your kid's trying to tell you something that's really important to them, you feel guilty there as well. So, I mean, it is interesting too, because they say, um, they did some studies that get Google about segregators versus integrators. And people who are segregators by nature are much happier with the way that they're doing things. Like 50% of people who are integrators and doing that would prefer to be segregators. <laughs> it's just that they have a hard time doing so. And I think that technology being always around us makes it much harder to be a, a segregator because, you know, 25 years ago, you left the office, you didn't have a cell phone, you didn't have a laptop, you know, you were, you were by default a segregator. Yeah, no, totally. And that, that, uh, that kind of segues into something I wanted to talk about, about with how are you, um, you talk about how technology is, can make us all more likely to be integrators because we're constantly getting interrupted by our technology. You know, we have an email or a Facebook notification pop up on our phone. How are you using technology to gain traction in your career and help you remain focused and help you manage your time opposed to it just be a distraction? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple things. So first thing is I turn off almost all push notifications on anything. I don't have desktop notifications for anything. None of that, like you have an email. Uh, I don't have Facebook notifications. There are a couple of things that I, I have, I mean, the text pops up and I get a notification about that. But uh, for the most part, if I can turn off the notification, I turn off the notification. 
And I do that so that I get to control when I access these things. Because what is happening when you get a notification is that you think, oh, I've turned on that notification. I want this. But really, you're just interrupting yourself from whatever it is that you were wanting to be doing at that time. And so it's you're, you're physically switching your focus. And studies uh, out of the Greater Good Science Center in California have shown that every time we get distracted from the thing that we're focused on, it takes on average 23 minutes to come around to the task again. So notifications is a huge thing uh, that I turn off. And then on how does technology help me, yeah, I'm a huge fan of different to-do apps and productivity apps like that. So for me, because I'm a segregator, I have one system for work and I have another system for home. Uh, and so I keep everything on a to-do list. I think my, you know, I, my central tenet, what I tell everybody is never rely on your memory. Like relying on your memory is the absolute worst thing that you can do because the moment you have these things flipping around in your head all the time, uh, that means you're not, you're not able to focus on what you're trying to do right now. And so if something has popped into my head more than once, it's on a list. Like it's not coming off of that list and the lists are prioritized in one place so that I have everything I need to do in one single place and that I can sort it by date or whatever I need to do. So those are the two primary ways that I use technology. That's really helpful, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've noticed that uh, when, when I clear my head onto an app <laughs> or use my technology to organize my life, my to-do list, my priorities, my schedule, all of that, I'm not just more focused as I'm doing tasks, but I'm also more focused as I'm communicating with people. And I love to see the connection between those two things because if, if uh, when we're clear, we, we communicate better, we're open, we're able to listen to people better so our relationships improve, but also we're able to manage our time better, like you're saying, and we're able to, to focus on our tasks better. And, and when we do that, we get things done in time, we get th more things done, and when we follow through on all of our commitments, then people trust us more. And right. it kind of keeps cycling back and we keep improving our relationships and those two things keep kind of reinforcing each other. So, yes, it's a good virtuous cycle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. What when and you're I want to go back to um, kind of what you said about the integrators and segregators for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned how um, a lot of the integrators who are more natural at integration um, kind of wish there were segregators because they're realizing that they don't like their mind being on all this stuff all the time. Um, in your experience, have you ever kind of met an integrator that is being an integrator in a healthy way or should all of us really figure out how to be more of a segregator? I mean, I think, so I feel very firmly that there is no right way for everyone, right? I mean, I think that's something that I use in my consulting and coaching practice all the time is that like, just because something works for me, that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be tweaked for you or that you don't need a slightly different way of thinking about it because everyone's brains work differently. And so, you know, it doesn't all work for all of us. But in terms of integrators and segregators, I think there's a small, a smaller population of people who truly are integrators who really thrive that way. And I'm thinking a lot of, you know, CEOs of com like major companies and things like that. They, it's much harder for them to be a segregator because their de the demands on their time are so great. But a lot of them also report being very stressed when they're not able to not necessarily be working all the time, but know what's going on at work. Because there's that the other side of being a segregator, right, is that when you get back from a vacation, you have, a, you know, 200 emails that you have to look at. And that piece is really much more stressful for integrators. They prefer to kind of know what's going on the whole time, even if they're not really engaged in work. Uh, but I think it's a much smaller number. I think mm. that people feel this real sense of commitment or uh, you know, obligation to always be connected because that's where the world has led us. And I think a lot of times people are afraid to say like, no, I prefer to separate things. That's how I work best. Because I think a lot of times people are just not confident enough to you know, tell their boss that, right? Like, hey, I, you know, I do better when I have time to disconnect. So I'm going to disconnect. Is that cool with you? Call me if you need something. I think that's just a hard conversation for a lot of people to have, especially when they're in the beginning of their career and they're not super confident yet about their role and their abilities. Do you, do you think that uh, 
that we, when you when you mentioned about how you know a lot of times CEOs of bigger companies struggle the most because they'd rather just ongoingly be filtering through their emails and they keep getting interrupted and they want to know what's going on and even if they're on a vacation that they have a hard time separating from that and I've seen that you know with people I've worked for where you know the the the, the boss I'm working for goes on vacation but we're continuing to communicate even while they're gone um, and do you think that if a leader of a company had a team that he or she really trusted and delegated certain responsibilities because you've worked for different companies and have some experience seeing systems in place do you think that if they were they, if they delegated properly that they would have an easier time maybe separating themselves when they do go on a vacation if they have if they do have that trust with with their team i so yes i think so but i think the other thing that i've seen really frequently with entrepreneurs is that letting go and giving up control is really difficult for them so that they still feel all the pressure on their own shoulders. So even if they're able to delegate the work, they aren't able to delegate the pressure. And I think that prevents them from being able to sort of fully let go. But I also think that on the teams that I've been on and on the companies I've worked for, where that type of disconnection is a top-down thing, you know, where the bosses say like, okay, you're going on vacation, perfect, I'll see you in two weeks, and aren't expecting you to check your email, or, you know, companies where it's like, okay, everybody's out of the office by six o'clock, and I'm not expecting an email after six o'clock. Those are the companies that I think people feel uh, emotionally and psychologically the best at, because they don't have that internal struggle between like, this is what I want to do, and but up here, the boss or you know, the people above me are having a different set of expectations for me. And I think that expectation mismatch can really be damaging to people because then they get stuck in, you know, okay, I'm obliged to do this thing, but I really want to be acting in this other way. Yeah, no, that's, that's really insightful because, yeah, it, if, 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 you know, if the CEO has a certain type of behavior, but if they're also expecting the employees to behave that same way when they're on vacation and so forth, but they don't want to, and then there's that disconnect, whereas, you know, maybe it's possible that, you know, the CEO could have his own behavior, but at the same time, um, be like, okay, I respect that you as an employee don't want any kind of work interruptions during your vacation, and I'm okay with that. But it takes that communication to make sure you're on the same page with how all that runs. And also, I think, you know, you actually do have to lead by example, because I think the reality is if your CEO tells you, it's okay, don't check email, I'm not expecting you to, but when the, they go on their own vacations, they're checking email the whole time, in your mind, you're thinking like, are they really, is that true? Are they really, do they really believe that? Or like, are they just saying that, but then they're going to think less of me when I come back and I haven't been, you know, so I, I think it actually does, you know, require that you lead by example for employees to feel fully confident that this is an okay way to be. Right, because I've experienced that too, where I felt kind of guilty because, uh, you know, I, like I've had bosses where they've told me, okay, like when you're on vacation, don't feel like you have to, like they've actually told me that, don't feel like you have to check email, don't feel like you have to do that, it's okay, you can just come to it on Monday or on the weekend or something when I'm not working. Um, but then when they didn't behave that way, I did feel kind of this, I was playing this guessing game with myself of, uh, I wonder if like, she's uh, hoping that I actually do check it and that this is some test and that maybe, uh, you know, uh, she'll trust me more or he'll trust me more if if I end up staying in my work all the time. And no, it, it can kind of cause some weird tension there when you're playing that guessing game with yourself. And yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. You mentioned something earlier about uh, kind of when you're on the subject of kind of, you know, vacations and when you're not working that life-work balance about disconnecting we need time to disconnect. And that's an interesting concept, how we we need time where we are focused and we are connected to what we're trying to do at a certain on a certain task at a certain time. But we need the time to also deliberately disconnect. And that, like in my own experience, I've realized that if I don't deliberately disconnect enough, I accidentally disconnect at the wrong times when I don't want to be disconnecting and it interferes with my career in that way. What what is kind of your experience with that? And what are some things that you've, uh, uh, how have you been able to kind of figure out a, a good balance for disconnection versus connection? 
Yeah. So yeah, I mean, to I totally understand what you're talking about. And like, isn't that why we all have our best business thoughts in the shower, right? It's like, you're totally disconnecting. And that's why you're getting some sort of idea that's good. And that's why we sleep, right? We sleep because we need to disconnect from our lives to be able to like actually be healthy. Um, but in terms of like, how did I actually do that? So I have, uh, I do two things. I do end of day and end of week planning sessions every day. So just in my calendar, the last 10 minutes of my work day is an end of day planning session. And essentially what I'm doing during that time is I'm looking through my task list and seeing what did I not get done today? Because the reality is that we're never going to be able to get done everything that we wanted to get done in a day. Like it's just not feasible. And I also feel like I, you know, I hate this idea of having overdue tasks, right? Because if you didn't do it today, that just means it wasn't a priority. <laughs> And it needs to be prioritized because what you did do was the things that were a priority today. So even though we wanted to get 30 things done and we only got 20, we focused on the 20 things that were the most, that had the highest prioritization. And so I spend that 10 minutes or so going through my task list, moving, things. you know, maybe I'll realize, oh, that thing I wanted to do today, it actually really doesn't need to be done until next week. And so I'll push the date on that. Um, and I also do what I call the brain dump where I sit there and I'm, I like anything that's been going on in my head or any notes that I've written down during the day, I transfer all of that into my one single system for tasks, essentially. And I reprioritize everything so that when I actually disconnect, when I close my computer for the day, I'm fully sure that I haven't missed anything. I'm not forgetting anything. I don't have those work thoughts running around in my head. And that when I start the next day, I already have a pre-prioritized task list, so I don't have to waste any time um, figuring out what do I want to work on next? What do I want to work on first? I've already done that. And so I can just hit the day running. Well, that totally just corrected my behavior. And I'm realizing something I need to change right now, because uh, when you talked about how I hate the idea of overdue tasks, I hate overdue tasks, Yeah. but I'm constantly telling myself that when I don't accomplish certain tasks that I wanted to accomplish in that day, then now they're overdue. And then when they keep getting overdue, the stress keeps building and right. it's just overwhelming. So I'm gonna implement that starting tomorrow that uh, th rather than getting into that guilt cycle that if, that I need to just tell myself at the end of the day, okay, well, I got these 10 things done. I was hoping to get these 20 things done, but guess what? Those 10 things were the most important. So mm -hmm. my day is complete. I can now disconnect, I can move on and now I can take those 10 things and move it into the next day or reorganize my priorities in whatever way. But to kind of, be able to go to sleep knowing that I never have any overdue tasks. So that's yeah, yeah. super helpful. How have you found your voice in your career? And what does, that, what does that mean to you to find your voice in your career? So, yeah, I think the part of it is that I, you know, I've, I've had my career for 20 years or so. I never would have imagined where I ended up from where I started. I mean, my, I majored in existentialism, education theory, and studio art. And I ended up having a business career in HR and operations and now I'm in. So these things are like very disconnected from each other. Um, but I think that I've sort of followed my gut on every job that I've taken essentially, uh, which led me in the place that I am now. And I think that one thing that happens when finding your voice is just that you start to view yourself as an expert in a certain area, right? Um, sort of over time, you've started working in this area, you've seen that other people give you good feedback in this area, and you start to really value yourself as an expert that can teach and show other people that. And so once I found that I can help sort of many different people, it became easy for me to have a voice of authority, essentially, to help people come up with solutions for themselves. And that is one of the biggest things that I've struggled with is seeing myself as an expert in what I am trying to accomplish in my career. And because we talk ourselves out of it all the time, right? I mean, we, we, we get into a certain career path and then we, we see people who are ahead of us, but then we keep telling ourselves like, oh no, I'm not an expert at this. I need, I need you know, 30 years of experience before I can be an expert at this. And we, uh, of course, we're gonna have our own definitions of what it means to be an expert at something, um, but there's a, I really believe that everyone knows something that other people don't know. 
because of not only what they've studied, but also their experience and their life experience. So everyone is an expert at something. It's not about comparing how many years of experience you have with this or that. Everyone, if they, if they, if they, if they talk themselves into it, can realize that they are an expert in something. And just because you're an expert doesn't mean now you're perfect. So you can keep getting to higher and higher levels of expertise but it's important that earlier on you start calling yourself an expert in this thing, whatever it is in your career, so that you now have the confidence to keep getting better and better. But I think sometimes maybe we avoid calling ourselves an expert because then we think, oh, an expert, once I'm an expert, I'm now at the end. I'm now perfect at it. I'm now done progressing. I'm now, you know, and, and so we kind of, we, we almost elevate it too much to the point of like, then we end up never achieving it. We, and we just keep talking ourselves out of career success because we have a hard time seeing ourselves as, as an expert. So thanks for making that connection between finding your voice in your career and seeing yourself as an expert in whatever it is you do because that's, that's, that's a really important side of it. Yeah. What is something that you've had to disconnect from maybe in your own habits or patterns or thoughts? And what is one thing you've had to connect to in order to kind of get to the next stage in your career? Sure. So I think that I was thinking about this and I think that like the thing that I've had to disconnect from is simply the belief that I need stability in a job or working for another company because I, you know, I knew at this self-employment part of this, um, I've always been a W2 employee for a company. And while I've had, you know, not a lot of management because I've always you know, I've always worked for startups and I've always been kind of in control of my own domain. Uh, I have always had that paycheck coming in. And I think a big leap for me to sort of propel my career forward was to get out of that comfort zone and realize that like it is possible for me to earn a living solely based on my own merits, not through a paycheck that, um, that I'm receiving from someone else to do work for them, essentially. And so I think yeah, that's it. And, and I'm still, I'm not there hundred percent. I'm still working on, <laughs> working on disconnecting from that belief. Um, but I'm getting there. And I think that's a really important one uh, for me as someone who's sort of had, had that stability my entire career. And then I think the thing that I have needed to connect to was that uh, it also a belief, a belief that it isn't narcissistic to talk about yourself if you're trying to help other people. Right, because I think I, you know, I come from, uh, I don't know, my background is such that like, I don't like to talk about myself. I don't like to talk myself up, um, but that's 100% necessary when you're trying to start a new business and when the service that you're trying to sell or the good that you're trying to sell is essentially yourself and your expertise. Uh, and so that's something that, uh, again, I'm still working hard to you know, bring that belief into full existence in my world. Um, and I think the only thing that helps is that you just do it, right? You just have to do it. You just have to do it and realize that it doesn't feel as bad or as smarmy as you thought it was going to. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've struggled with that a lot because I, so like I, growing up, I've always, I, I was more shy and I tried so hard to avoid coming across as, you know, cocky or prideful that I ended up being pretty selfish because I was only, uh, kind of thinking about myself in that way, but it's okay to talk passionately about what I'm doing and what my goals mm -hmm. are and, and, and what I love doing. But as long as I maintain interest in the other person I'm talking to, then even as I talk about myself, um, it's, I'm still interested in them and I'm still wanting to know what their value is and I still wanna connect with them and I've found that like when we are just really interested in the person we're speaking with, they end up asking us a lot of questions that prompt us to talk about ourselves. But then in that moment, we have to be willing to then speak up and speak confidently about our value because a part of finding our voice as well is being able to understand our own value and being able to express that to other people. Because if we can't express our value to other people, then no one's gonna hire us. You know, we're gonna be in an interview and the employer is not going to be able to see value in us if we don't see any value in ourselves, and and it really goes a long way. So, right. And I also think that for me, what was helpful in sort of helping to establish that belief is that what I realized is like I'm not necessarily trying to sell myself to all these people that I'm talking to, but 
if more people know about me and what I'm doing, then they might have some other connection where they're talking to a friend of theirs and they, their friend is talking about how they're struggling with time management. And because I've had that conversation with them, now they're thinking back, oh, wait, I know someone who could help you. And so I think for me, like realizing that it's like, it's like seven layers of separation or whatever, that it's not necessarily that I'm, I'm not interested necessarily in selling the person that I'm talking to right now. I'm interested in more people knowing that I'm offering this skill set so that the people in their lives who might need it or their lives who might need it and going farther and farther out become aware that this exists. That's so funny you mentioned that. Literally yesterday, I was in another interview where somebody had said that when you're connecting with people, it's important that you also think several levels out of who this person is gonna connect you to, who's gonna connect you to this person. And you just mentioned it, the same thing in a different way. And so th that's just really cool. Um, and so clearly there's something, it's something that I need to do better at because, and now that I've heard it a second time, I realize that I, I've really got to do better at this because sometimes I'm, I'm seeing just the one person I'm getting to know as the end point. And sometimes that relationship is only a, a relationship that's gonna connect you to maybe another relationship that really is more long-term. That it's okay if we have these temporary relationships. Um, it doesn't mean we end on a bad terms. It just means that okay, we realize that our relationship was a temporary thing that helped both up us that helped us both lead to other people that then connected us to to other places. So or it doesn't even need to be temporary, right? I mean, you can have a relationship with someone that they then connect you to other people, and you still have a relationship. It doesn't have to be a business relationship, productive, whatever it is. Um, like, yeah, you don't have to see that as the end and the beginning of something else. It's just different levels. Yeah, definitely. Let's, in the next few minutes, let's just close with a couple of quick uh, time management hacks that you found are really helpful. It can be for business or it can be like home management related, but you know, two or three, uh, some time management tips you have for us. Sure. So batch processing is sort of my number one tip, and that can be applied to home and work. And what that means essentially is grouping like tasks together. So for home management, let's say, like I do this in a number of ways, one of which is breakfasts for my children. I make 30 breakfast burritos. I freeze them. I put them in the freezer. Now my kids have several weeks worth of breakfast that they can pop out of the you know, to in the, pop out of the freezer, put in the toaster oven without my help. And it took me 10 minutes, you know? And then how can that be applied to, to business? So other ways, like only open the mail once a week. Like let it pile up and then take 10 minutes opening and processing the mail. Uh, only do your email a couple of times a day. So instead of being interrupted by email constantly, say that you're gonna do email at 10 o'clock, one o'clock and four o'clock. You're going to spend, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes on it each time, but you're not going to answer it in any other time. And these types of things help you not only stay in the same mindset for each type of task, which means that it's happening more quickly and more efficiently, but it also helps you to save time in the long run because anytime you batch something, it's going to take less, like it'll take more time than it would have to do one, but it's going to take much less time overall. Uh, and then uh, for last one, I have sort of a, a one touch rule, which means that if I like, I don't check, I don't look at email if I don't have time to deal with it. I don't look at it a response. Like I never want to be opening something and reading it and then putting it back again because I don't have time to deal with it. I only want to be looking at something once. So if I don't have time to deal with it, I don't even look at it at all. Because if I start to look at it, then it's going to start taking up space in my mind. And I don't want that. Um, I guess, and then one more, one more last one, the two minute rule, which is if something takes less than two minutes, just do it now. Don't put it on a to-do list. Don't, you know, it's going to take you just as long to put it on your to-do list as it would to do it. You just do it. And that saves a ton of time. That's fantastic. Those are really, really great tips. And I hope that all of you create some action steps to apply exactly what, she, what, what you, Alexis, just taught us. Because that, uh, those are some things I need to try is to, is to look, because I do that all the time where I, I open an email and thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll have time for it. And then I end up not having time for it. And then sometimes I forget to even go back to it. Or now it's taking up space in my mind, like you said. Um, so that is really helpful. Thanks for sharing that with us. I mean, I could spend all day talking to you about this because it seems like you know so much. You have a lot of experience with, with systems and processes and time management and how to adjust your focus. And where can we find out more about you and connect to you so that we can benefit more from what you have to teach us? Yes. So um, my website is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. It's 
uh, of course, my name is very hard to spell, but it's alexishasselberger.com, which is A-L-E-X-I-S-H-A-S-E-L-B-E-R-G-E-R.com. I know I need to come up with a much catchier title for people to remember it, but that's probably the easiest. And then my email is alexis at alexishasselberger.com. Uh, so I'd love to hear from anyone out there that needs help with this stuff. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Anyone out there, if you need some help with your time management, with your focus, get in contact with Alexis and she will absolutely help you connect your way to where you want to be. And I thank you, Alexis, for coming on our show today. And all of you, hope you have a great day. Thanks so much, Dad.